Hold on one second. Okay, awesome. If you would go on and lead us in prayer, Mrs. Stella. Yes. Thank Dear you. Heavenly Father, we thank you this afternoon bringing us to the uh, Serenity Book Club. I pray that you will open up our minds and our understandings. I thank you for Reverend Yvette hosting this book club, and I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts to see the word and the re revelation of, of this book book kingdom prayers will come alive in our lives in jesus name i pray amen amen praise god thank you so much yeah so we're continuing in this tremendous book um, by tony evans uh kingdom prayer touching heaven to change earth what a great book uh i don't know if you all have been enjoying it or not yeah. but i sure have um, and especially after uh, Pastor um, uh, Leslie spoke, she yes, prayed yes, on yes. a area of persistent prayer. So this goes along with what we've yes. been talking about, what we've been praying about, what our morning glory prayer times have been about is to really just try to touch the heart of God and yes. to persistently uh, follow after Him. So, with that in mind. I wanted us to uh, get in our minds that we may not go past uh, chapter eight because there's just so much meat in uh, chapter seven and eight that I yeah. wouldn't want us to miss anything in that. So with that in mind, first of all, before we just go through the passages, uh, the uh, pages themselves, uh, were there some things that just kind of stood out with you on that? Uh, for me, it was um, when you're praying and you and you don't see your prayers getting answered. Uh, still, be thankful in the prayer, like just like Daniel when his prayers were held up um, by the um, Satan, the demon, and uh, Michael had to come and uh, and um, beat up that demon and cast him out. And, uh, but his prayers had already been answered. So that, that was encouraging to me to still be persistent in prayer, you know, no matter what it looks like and be thankful for it to God. That's awesome. I, I agree with that. And I think that that even goes along with the sermon that she preached on last night. Um, Carolyn? Well, there was a couple of things. Um, I'm sorry, my mind is everywhere. I've been in a seminar all morning. I'm doing a nine-hour seminar. You stay no, right. No worries. No worries. <laughs> but one of them was how well we all come together to pray. I really like that. And the power that we have behind it. And the other one was when you don't have anyone, when you know that you mess it up, I think you said or whatever, and you get someone to walk with you to help you, you know, when two or two or more. You have more power and more strength. So you find someone to help walk with you, to help you get through this stuff. And so I think there was other, but those too. Yeah, I, th I think that you're right. I think both of you had some great insight from that. He starts with that two or three together. Uh, I think that most of us who've grown up in church or we've been around church for at least five or six years, we've heard that statement being made where two or three are gathered together that God would be in the midst. And we know that it comes from the scripture. But I like the fact that um, when Tony Evans is making his um, leap into this chapter, he talks about the fact that, you know, that there is, um, he gives this illustration about Corporal Myers' care. Um, I thought that he gives these great illustrations in the beginning to talk about cooperative efforts. And I think that sometimes in the church, we think that our only cooperative effort happens in our time that we go to church within the walls. And we don't think about the corporate benefit 
of touching and agreeing with someone within your uh, sphere, your influence, a prayer partner, people around you who would agree with you in prayer when you can't get it pushed through yourself. Um, one of the things that he talks about in his illustrations is he talks about how oftentimes um, he gave the, the idea that when someone was wounded, that they were able to hop on the back of someone else, right? And I think that that's sometimes what we fear is that we're wounded. And so we're afraid to hop on somebody else's back to carry this on because we think that we might have too much weight for them. So we don't want to break them down or we might be afraid that they can't carry us. <laughs> There's so many different reasons that keep us from really beginning to embrace this two or three. Or we have been hurt before, church hurt, where I've shared with you you know, something very personal with me, you know, for you to pray about, but then you wind up using it as a prayer gossip portion. And so I think that that's some reasons why we shy away from that two or three gathering together because somehow our trust or the lack thereof uh, comes in the way, or sometimes we're just even afraid to just share our hearts because we don't want people to know that we're in this slump or we're in this place or we're in this struggle. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, guys? For me, I totally agree with you. More so than anything, I think it's the church hurt that really has hindered me from that more than anything. It has happened to me so many times in church. To the point where one time uh, a lady even went to jump on me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, they just get so vicious sometimes when you're sharing things. But one of the things that I know is that unfortunately we go to church as we are just with a whole bunch of Christian and saints. Well, we don't, we don't stop and look like, no, this is a fellowship of sinners. There's not anybody there who's not a sinner. Mm -hmm. Everybody there is a sinner. So we all need to learn to embrace that. You have fallen short somewhere. I mean, I hold you in high, high, high esteem, Reverend Yvette. <laughs> but I know that somewhere along the road, you have had issues and problems yourself. So if I come to you with a problem, I expect for you to more to embrace me and to encourage me and to lift me up with it and to try to tear me down more with it. Yeah, yeah. We all go through it. And uh, if we're honest, if right. we're honest, we're all struggling through life. Yes, Mrs. Stella? I was going to say, uh, I personally have learned church hurt. Uh, I've shared things, you know, with confidence. And um, it's been used as ammunition towards me. Um, they might not, the person I confided in might not have thought that, but like you said, that uh, prayer gospel, you know, and, and that, well, that sort of made me put like on ass, like when people say, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good, you know, you don't wanna, cause you don't know who to trust, you know, and, and that's that when it's, you know, in a in the church, you know that church hurt is hard to to uh, get over because I feel like, you know, if I shared something and you used it against me, and it's in a group of people you've used it against me, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to share with you anything personal anymore. Yeah, yeah. So that's hard. Yeah. Absolutely. Hello, Veronica. We're glad you're on. And thank you, Ms. Vivian, uh, for showing up as well. Uh, feel free to um, jump in. We will make sure that we include your remarks here from Facebook as well. Um, but yeah, I think that that's why we tend not to have that confidence in prayer because of church hurt or because we think that our burden is too heavy, or we think that we are supposedly looked up as 
being a spiritual giant. So we don't really need anyone else and understanding that uh, there is a reason and a rationale for us to need one another. God made us beings to need one another. And so if we have the need to need one another, why would we think that in our prayer time that we wouldn't need one another? It's, uh, it's one of those mysteries that we can only know and kind of deal with on that regular basis. Uh, I, one of the things- I'm sorry. Go on, no, 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 please go. Yes. I'm yes. sorry. Can I just add in? And another Absolutely. thing is, we look at people. It's nowhere in the world I could imagine that it's still have been through some of the things I've been through. So I then take it that she has no understanding. And I look at her like, oh, she had this perfect life. Look at her. She could do this and she could do that. And she has this. And she... So we go by worldview instead of going by the spiritual view of seeing people and things. So that's also stop us from really diving in there and, and confiding in others and allowing them to walk with us and help us along our path. Yeah, yeah, I think that that is all true. Anything else that you wanna share before we move on to this next section? Okay. So in, um, after he gives this example of about um, you know, kind of relying on one another to carry you through. He says on page 90, you may be like Heather or Hannah, which was some of the examples in this book. He says, who we looked at in our last chapter crumbled up in pain. Because remember, she was in a lot of pain uh, when she pulled that ligament. Uh, but still able to have faith that you need to get up and carry you through as you continue in your prayer path. If this is you, then I want to encourage you to never give up. Despite the tears, scars, and what other people may say, listen to the announcer calling from heaven, watch out for, and then put your name in there. So watch out for Carolyn, watch out for Estella, watch out for Veronica, watch out for Vivian, watch out for Diane, watch out for Yvette, you're gonna make it. And that's oftentimes when we talk about these two or three gathered together, it gives us a chance to be encouraged um, too, because we need encouragement regardless of what the poet said, you know, uh, he really articulated it. No man is an island. <laughs> no man stands alone, you know, and we know that our particular uh, rock is Jesus. We know that when all the confidence is lacking in mankind that we can rely on Jesus, but there should be at least one or two other people in your life that you can gather together, begin to trust, who will stand in the gap for you and pray with you. One of the things that he says here is we were created to live together and even pray together. God hears our collective prayers. And then he goes on with the argument that there is power in collaborative or collective prayers. But why do, we, why do we resist the power? Why do we resist the power that's in reaching out? Because yeah, we might have been burned one or time or two, you know, by some people, but you know, just like we're flawed, just like they're flawed, we might have burned some people indiscriminately as well along the way. So we have to begin to trust again and believe again so that we can have other people to stand in the gap for us. And then understanding when you're selecting those partners or those people to agree that they understand what their role is. You know, this is not a gossip session. This is me sharing with you, you sharing with me, us coming together before God, because one can put a thousand to flight, but two, 10,000, we need to have the opportunity to go to prayer together, yes. So he says that 
And he says that the power of collective prayer, he says collective kingdom prayer is a power unto its own. Many times through the scriptures, we witness God responding to the collective cries, groans, praises, and prayers of his people. A cursory glance of the Bible turns up multiple scenarios of people or even the very entire nation crying out to God and God hearing our collective prayer. And he starts in Exodus 2 and 23 when, uh, when the Israelites had been um, in slavery and they begin to just cry out to the Lord together. I think that because we have so many things that we're dealing with that we just don't want to cry out with somebody else, uh, that we don't want to trust someone else to come alongside of us. And that is the part where we lose out on the power of God in our collective prayers. Veronica says that uh, I think it's trust, shame, and people are private. That's true too. I think that we have allowed our need for privacy to keep us from the benefit of collective two to three gathering prayer uh, because of what we've had in the past. Well, if I tell them this, you know, they're going to think this of me, or, you know, maybe uh, they think that I'm further on, you know, um, the shame that we experience. Um, I'm feeling like, you know, I haven't been a good steward with my money. And so, so I'm broke. But then I share that with you and then you lecture me about being a good steward. Yeah, that's I, I need the I need the aids. I need all of that, you know, and yeah, I need to get into that class, you know, Pastor Stephen, Pastor um, uh, uh, Miss Michelle has offered these courses so that we can, you know, have our financial freedom. But right now, <laughs> this is where I am. I'm going to get that help, but I need you to agree with me so that as I learn these tools, I can implement these tools. Or I say to you, you know, uh, the doctor says that um, I need to lose 20 pounds or 30 pounds or what have you. And then um, I come to you and I say, you know, let's pray about that. Let's, let's go to God about this so that he can give me wisdom and knowledge on how to do that. But then you're like, yeah, girl, you need to lose some pounds. Well, yeah, I just told you I needed to lose some pounds. So it's not, it's not a matter of even of us having the privacy issue, but sometimes it's the level of our pride that gets in the way of us getting the benefit of the collective prayer time. What are some of your thoughts on that, guys? I, I agree with what you said. Like, I can pray for others, but um, as far as me personally, you know, I can intercede for others, but as far, like I said, uh, sometimes when I, when I, confide in people and ask for prayer it sounds like I'm whining. You know, sometimes people think they don't want to hear it over and over again. So that makes me clam up, you know. But I agree where two or three are gathered in the midst. Because I like, like I'm on the prayer line with a group of women and uh, we pray. And, uh, but as far as, and I have somebody else that calls me and said, let's pray and I'll do that. But, but I sort of stopped sharing a lot about my business, you know, because like I said, I've been burnt. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that we do, we find ourselves kind of uh, coming away from the whole prayer partnership. Uh, but I don't think that we really understand what prayer partnership is all about. And then the idea that you feel like you're whining, you know, if God is not, you know, angry with your whining or your persistent prayer, as Pastor Leslie was saying last night, um, why would you worry about how you sound? You know, uh, God is good 
uh, and he's fine with us, you know, not being okay sometimes. Sometimes it's okay not to be okay. Sometimes uh, we can cry out our tears. Um, almost 70% of the psalmist that you see in the scriptures, you know, is crying out about something, you know, and, and they, but they always turn a phrase at the end, you know, although God, they're coming against me. Oh yeah, I'm in a cave. This is happening. They're throwing darts at me. I don't know what I'm going to do. This is happening, God. I can't figure out what's going on. I'm angry, blah, blah, blah. Yet, I will trust in you. And so it's not a matter of us being private or even being whining. It's a matter of us going to God who we can trust, right? So our collective prayers, he talks about that and he gives examples um, in Exodus 14 and 10, when Pharaoh drew the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. They became very frightened and the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Remember when they got to the point where they realized that, you know, that the armies were coming after them, even after they crossed the Red Sea, uh, they realized that, yeah, the same sea that had opened up to them is the same sea that now uh, Pharaoh's army was coming through. They didn't realize that God had opened up that situation for them, and they didn't realize that that was the only one that he had opened up the seas for. And so sometimes in our glance, we go and we cry out to God and say, God, I know that you may not know this, but the armies are coming after us. And sometimes in our distress or our anxiety or whatever that we're dealing with at the time, we have to cry out to God and say, God, I need your help. And then you cry out with me and then you cry out with me and we all cry out together and say, God, on behalf of what's happening right now, we need your help. We need your help in our country uh, so that our country is not in disarray. We need uh, your help as it relates to this pandemic and all the other diseases that are coming our way. God, we need your help. God, we need you right now because there are things that are happening in our neighborhoods and our streets that just doesn't seem right, but we can cry out together and God will hear us just like he heard them. Uh, Sheree says, I don't like lecture, but I need prayer about some things. I don't like sharing everything at the same time and I'm not ashamed to share. Well, that's not the case for all of us because some of us are ashamed because we are ashamed of what that looks like on us, you know? And so what we should look like, you know, you should be past that. Uh, have you ever had a loss of a loved one? And then, you know, it's been a month, it's been two months and they say, are you still crying about that? Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually I am. You know, we have a way in the body of Christ to not be as compassionate about it. However, one of the things in collaborative or collective prayer is that we're going to God with one mindset. You know, God, we need you. That's what they were crying at the moment. The whole of Israel needed God's protection and the sons of Israel cried out to God and God answered that prayer. He also says in Judges 3 and 9, he gives the scriptures that the son of Israel cried out to the Lord and the Lord raised a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. There are times in which we have to come together as the church and pray collectively for things that are so big and beyond us. We need to have two or three gathering together, knowing that he's in the midst of us and asking him collectively for insight. He gives many more examples in the scripture as you look in the book on page 92. And then he goes to the New Testament times in which they gather together. 
One of the things that you all will remember, even from the book of Acts, when Paul and Silas were locked in the jail cell and they began to cry, they began to sing, and they began to pray together. And because of that, not only were they freed, not only were the locks broken out, but also those who were spiritually broken, like the jailer, his whole life turned around because they weren't trying to escape they were just showing the power of God. They weren't trying to get out of their loose. They weren't trying to escape any of them. But because of the power of God in collective prayer, they were able to get a miracle happen. And not only were they set free in their own spirits for being wrongfully jailed, but also everybody who were around them were encouraged. And then the jailer became a believer. Is it that sometimes we don't get those big things happening in our lives in prayer because we're not willing to gather on a regular basis where two or three together to be in the midst to ask God for big things? I just wanted to ask your opinion on that. What are your thoughts? I'm told in total agreement with you. Sometimes because we don't come together and pray. I have seen, I have myself, I can only speak for me, pray for things. And I pray over and over and over. But once I get other people to church and agree with me and we pray together, I actually can see that change. I'm like, okay, Lord, I've been begging for a long time now, but now that I have them, it's happening. So I have seen it and it works. The power of collective prayer. Yeah, Jesus wouldn't have said it if it wasn't something that we needed. Um, sometimes even in sharing that need, sometimes someone is able to meet that need even within your circle. You just never know what God is going to do. And even if they can't, they can stand with you and believe with you and trust God with you. And it's good for you to have prayer partners. It's good for you to have a prayer community. On page 94, it says that, uh, he says, it is good to pray with or near one another. In many ways, it encourages each other. And we are, uh, uh, and we have been told to encourage one another. So 1 Thessalonians uh, 5 and 11, and also Hebrews 3 and 13. One of our greatest ways to do this is through prayer. And so when sometimes you have a prayer request, sometimes God will have someone in that circle of people to encourage you to say, you know, uh, God is not a respecter of person. I was through something similar, maybe not the same, because, you know, also that's another thing that we often think, oh, girl, I've been through the same thing. No, you weren't, but you've been through something similar. And so you can empathize with that and you can say to them, hey, look, God worked this out for me. This is what he did for me. Let me encourage you that he can do this for you because he's not a respecter of person. He doesn't love me more than he loves you. He's not going to do something more for, you, for me than he's going to do for you. And then we're supposed to encourage one another. So sometimes in our prayer times, and we have to have our personal prayer time. There's, there's no doubt. We have to have our personal one-on-one -on -one time with God. The next chapter that we go to really talks about that and making sure that you have that solitude. However, in this time, when you're with that two or three people that are gathering together, and it could be more, when you're gathering together, the encouragement that you get is that God can do miracles. And they can encourage you through that time to say, you know, it's okay, Vivian, Vivian, I've got you in my heart. You know, uh, Vivian, even though you went through that, um, you know, I just came out of that. You know, uh, I had breast cancer and, you know, now I'm healed. You know, so if God can do that for me, 
he can help you with your diabetes. You know, it may not be the same thing, but we can know and trust and believe together and pray together collectively so that people can be encouraged. That is one of the things about prayer is that if I don't see a breakthrough by having another person or two or three gathering, I can get someone else who will say, yeah, I know God has an answer yet, or yeah, we believe God with you. So it just encourages you to continue to pray as opposed to thinking I'm out this by myself and nobody knows really what I'm going through. We're singing the old Negro hymn. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. And so what we can also know is that when we have other people praying along, they can tell you, look, I may not have been through that, but I've been through something serious too. And so if God took me through, he's going to take you through too. So it's a purpose of encouragement. What are your thoughts on that? I agree. I agree. Um, with, with the collective prayer, praying together. And, uh, but one thing that I, I haven't been consistent in is my own private prayer. I, I pray together collectively, but my own private prayer I haven't been consistent with. And that's something I really have to work on. I mean, during the day, I, you know, like when I wake up in the morning, I said, thank you, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit for waking me up. Thank you for a new day. But as far as just sitting down, having, you know, prayer, prayer, just me and God, I haven't, you know, I can't say I can pray for 30 minutes or even like that. Yeah, I've got to work on that one. Okay. Well, you know, we're all at different levels. And that's why we're reading this book as well. We have read before. And so what we want to do is um, go to the next page, which is page 95 where he talks about the need for community prayer and action. And he starts out with Joshua uh, and her and that the need that was met, you all remember the battle in which Moses had to keep his arms raised. Uh, and while his arms were raised, the heavenlies were on their side. They were able to be victorious, but his arms got tired. And every time his arms would get tired, you know, they were whooping up on the Israelites. And so what was it the job of Joshua and her was to take his arms and lift it up and to say, you're not in this battle by yourself. You're not going to have to be victorious on your own. You're not going to have to deal with all of this stuff by yourself. We're with you, we're, we're struggling with you, we're loving on you, we're gonna hold your arms up. And that's what collective prayer does. It allows our arms to be held up because sometimes in prayer, we're tired. We've been to God hundreds of times about this and we're tired. We're tired, we get so tired and worn out and weary. And so someone coming along to lift up our arms helps us to continue to go on. If you ever been in praise and worship, I just think that's a perfect example is that you might be at the first part, you're just high, you know, ooh, we just bless you, we honor you, Lord God. And then as 20, 30 minutes of praise and worship comes down, you, your arms like this and just come down lower and lower. And that's kind of what we do in prayer is that I get tired. And so I need somebody to lift me up. And that's why we have collective portions of prayer. Uh, Vivian says, I know for sure by personal experience that God will bring you through whatever you're facing. And that is so right, Ms. Vivian. It is, the, it is the power of God that brings you through. But it's someone like the witness of Vivian to tell us God's going to do it. Amazingly, he's going to work it out. And, and so that gives us the encouragement to continue to pray. Anything else before we move on?
Well, let's go to page 96. He talks about the need for action. He continues that on. And Paul writes from 2 Corinthians 6 and 1. It says, we then as workers together with him. That's the A part of it. We then with workers uh, as workers together with him. We have to realize that we are working together in order for God to do some breakthroughs. In order for us to know that this coronavirus is going to be under tap, it's going to take believers all over the world praying because this is a pandemic. This is a worldwide problem. So we need worldwide Christians praying everywhere, every day for God to move in this miraculous time. It also gives us clarity when we're praying together to see what God is doing so that we're just not fixated on the situation at the time. Because isn't it easy for us to get fixated sometimes where our focus and our concentration is not on uh, God anymore, but you know what's gonna happen to me? What's gonna happen in this case? We, we get our eyes off of God, but other believers help us to fix our eyes back on God. Girl, you're gonna make it. Man, you're gonna, you're gonna be all right. Uh, the Lord is going to take care of you. If the Lord fed my children, he's going to feed yours. If he paid my rent, he's going to pay yours. If the mortgage, you know, needs to be addressed, uh, just like I was able to talk to my officer, you're able to talk to your officer. We have to believe together and trust and have not only that, but he says on page 97 to give emotional support. We have to have emotional support for one another. He says spiritual battles can be tiresome. Trust me, I know that as well as you. As Moses held up the rod high on the heels, his hands were heavy, according to Exodus 17 and 12. He grew weary and the weight began to accumulate. And oftentimes we just need to know somebody's there. So even if, you know, that person is not, a prayer warrior, so to speak, you know, they might not be powerful in God, you know, with a T at the end. They may not be all of that, but they are simply someone who's going to stand with you in the moment. They're going to intercede for you in the moment. And you know that you have this constant fellowship with this group of believers who are going to stand in the gap. And sometimes just knowing that somebody is there can make all the difference in the world. Because as Ms. Vivian says, God knows exactly what you're facing at the time. We just need other believers to say, don't get weary, don't get tired. We're here for you. We're just gonna be here to emotionally support you through this time because sometimes our days are not count, well, always, our days are not counted as the same as God's days. And so what seems like we've been going through a thousand days was only a day for him. And so then you ask the question, God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? He's like, I'm right here. I'm taking care of it. I already know what's going on. But you need sometimes people to encourage you along the way. Uh, at the bottom page of 98, he says the power or two or three. He says group prayer carries with a great kingdom authority. Right? He was talking about that in terms of the authority of two or three gathering. Um, I can definitely have more power if more people are praying alongside of me. Uh, Veronica says they have this, that saying, check on your strong friends, just check. Yeah, because even the strongest among us who are prayer warriors, you know, who, you know, oftentimes we don't pray like we should for our pastors and we don't pray for them because we think, okay, our pastors are strong. They need your fervent prayer 
just like everyone else. You would think that a person who is very wealthy, they don't need their prayers because they're wealthy. They can buy whatever they want, but they need your prayers as well because every human being has some issue, some situation that's going on. When Steve Jobs became ill, uh, who was the CEO of Apple, you know, it wasn't, you know, his money couldn't buy him out of death. His money could not buy him another day. There's celebrities that have been dying through this pandemic. Money and fame couldn't buy them out of their situation. But when you have believers standing beside you, holding your arms up, strengthening you, having the authority of God together to come before him when he says that if you ask in my name, I'm going to do it. And there's several people asking in his name, God has an obligation to move. Maybe not exactly the way we wanted him to move, but he will move on our behalf. And sometimes we'll get even the wisdom from others on how to pray those prayers. That's why we have to affix scripture because he, God is always going to honor his word. In the middle of page 99, he says that the context is critical in understanding these verses very fully. He says that God spoke about accountability for a believer. He said that if the believer does not turn from the sin, then bring alongside multiple people to address it so that by the mouth or two or three witnesses, every fact may be conformed. The phrase two or three witnesses is an Old Testament a phrase that they found in Deuteronomy 19 and 15. A single witness shall rise up against a man on an account of a iniquity or a sin uh, which he has committed on the evidence of two or three on a matter shall be confirmed. One of the things that we realize is that uh, when we're talking about the collective power of God, when we're talking about the collective parts of God, we understand that there is a critical understanding of scripture to help us to know what God is saying even in the moment. I can't take arbitrarily scriptures also to pray for, and I don't understand the context, you know? Um, oftentimes I have met Christians that said, I didn't have anything. I just went in here and, you know, I demanded that they sign me up for a new house. Well, okay, well, that's great. Uh, so when you get to the loan officer and they said no, then uh, now you're all surprised. However, when I went to my collective few of people and said, look, you know I need to move. I know I need to move. Uh, my situation is jacked up. Will you pray for favor and opportunity uh, and, and the ability for me to be able to speak on my behalf and that when they crunch the numbers, all those things will work out right. Uh, if you all follow Midday Bible Study, uh, Dr. Pullen, she talked about that just a couple of weeks ago where she said, you know, there was a time in which she pulled into the place and she needed something from God. God worked out a miracle. That is why you have to have people coming alongside of you with collective kingdom authority to make things happen. And Veronica says, and it makes your heart glad. So one of the things that you, we wanna do is realize that on page 100, he says, the key to answered prayer when it comes to group prayer is the symphonic orchestration of being on the same page or on one accord. I think that oftentimes if we are praying collectively and we are praying on one accord, then we realize that God can do a miraculous thing for us. He can make it happen. 
He can make things happen that we could not ask for on our own. And that's why that uh, scripture so rings with us sometimes that now unto God, who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we're able to ask or think. My prayers might be stunted because I put God into this little box. Your prayers for me might be more open to God doing some other stuff. And then your prayers might do something even more. And that's why we have to depend upon other people to pray and agree with us so that these answered prayers will come because God hears it as a symphony unto his ears saying, my people are crying out to me. My people are crying out to me and I hear their voice. It wasn't that he didn't hear your voice alone, but because we're bombarding heaven, like the woman you know, who came to the judge, we're bombarding heaven collectively, orchestratively, these miracles can happen and things can come. Any comments before we uh, we finish this up? Because I don't think we're going to even, unfortunately, get to chapter eight today. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. So let's move on to page 101. He says, when two or more agree on anything which God has authorized. That's the key, that God has authorized and they ask for it, it shall be done. I think that's why we get discouraged in prayer sometimes because we don't realize what God has authorized. What he's authorized is in his word and make sure that that promise was not to a specific person because I don't want God to authorize for me to have a baby, right? Like he did for Elizabeth and like he did for Mary. I don't need God to authorize that in my life right now, right? I don't need a Sarah moment in my life. However, because that's a promise that was to them individually, I have to find the, pro the promises of God that are to us collectively. And then to be able to pray that. So when two or three of us are gathering together, then we can say that God has authorized that because it's from his word. Then we can ask for it and it's going to be done for us. So isn't that amazing? That's a good thing. Veronica says, oh, your summation was it on all points. Okay, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this last section here that will talk about a God even tells husbands in 1 Peter 3 and 7, if they're not in alignment with their wives on all levels, then they might as well not pray. Well, that's true with all of us. We have to align with God align with God's promises so that we can make sure that we're not off. I, I can't ask God in my disobedience to bless my mess. Well, I can, but it's probably not going to happen. Why? Because the scripture is very clear that we have to align ourselves with God. Isn't that what 1 John 1 and 9 uh, tells us? That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I haven't confessed the sin, if I haven't dealt with my own stuff, then how can I ask God for more? So when we're looking at this two or three, we realize that uh, he's talking about in this book that we have to have this collective mindset that we've got to stop saying that I'm going to simply just do this on my own because I need my privacy. I'm going to do this on my own because of the church hurt that I've had in the past. I'm going to do this on my own. I have to realize that I am a wounded warrior, that I need the help of other people. Sometimes like Hannah getting on the back of somebody else in order for them to take him out. Sometimes like Moses who needed just somebody to come along to hold up his arms because he was so heavy. And sometimes we just need to have believers 
that we can trust together that will have the authorized power of God to go before him. So that's the end of this chapter. We're not going to be able to go any further today. We're going to go to chapter eight and hopefully chapter eight and nine next week. But are there any thoughts, any comments that you want to share as we end this uh, Serenity Book Club today? I just want to say thank you, Reverend Yvette. You made it very plain and uh, broke it down very good, you know, why we have to have uh, collective prayer and why we have to have prayer partners. So I thank you for that. You made it. The way you explained it was very good. You were on point. Thank you. I think Tony Evans did that for us all. So thank you. Yes. He did. Yes, he did. He was on point too. Mm -hmm. But I like the way you broke it down. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Anything else for the day? Just want to say thank you also. This is okay. such a powerful book. It is a powerful book, yeah, isn't it? Really it yeah. Like I said, it aligns with what Pastor Leslie was saying on last night. And, um, you know, also, you know, that's why we've been doing Morning Glory on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 6 a.m. Because, you know, one can chase a thousand, but two, 10,000. If you got more than that, we're chasing demons all the way so that God's word will uh -huh. come into our hearts that the miracles that we're seeking can happen and that the power of God can reign. So we, and yes, Veronica, we need to learn to ask for help. We need, we, uh, we need to ask for help. We need to come around and say, look, I have not trusted people in the past. I have a hard time trusting. Um, and then, you know, sometimes even in that trust, you have to give them a little bit. You just give them a little bit and then you see that they can be trusted with that. Then you can give them a little bit more. But we have to find people that we can surround ourselves with and be able to have that camaraderie. And when we do that, then we're going to have the power of that two or three. We're going to have the power of us together. And as Tony Evans said, and I think it was so aptly in this quote, um, more than anything else, is that we're created to live together and even to pray together. And God hears our collective prayers. And when we pray those and we're authorized to pray these prayers, nothing will be withheld from us. So praise God, praise God. Well, that's it for today's uh uh, Serenity Book Club. We'll see you next week. We'll be in chapters eight and nine as we continue to look at these ways that we can touch the kingdom of God. Once again, we're in this book and you can pop up anytime, but we're in this book. We're in Tony Evans' Kingdom Prayer, Touching Heaven uh, to Change Earth. And we need to know what that power is so that we can have these miracles you know, happening in our lives. God wants to do the miracles despite ourselves. He wants to do it. He wants to meet us in prayer. We just need to know what kingdom prayer is all about. So God bless you. We'll see you next week. It's Tony Evans, Kingdom Prayer. And we'll see you next week at Serenity Book Club in chapters two and I'm sorry, chapters eight and nine. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Be Thank blessed. You.